All right, the board is now going to reconvene to open session. I'm going to start with roll call since we're all remote. Uh, Mr. Talio. Here. Ms. Spicer. Here. Mr. Ivanovich. Present. Mr. K. Here. I'm also here. All board members are present. Um, before we go on to agenda approval, I just want to say um, sort of for the record that uh, the unfolding events right now are of course in all of our thoughts um, and our thoughts are within are with all of the members of our community that have been affected uh, by them. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have a forum to address address them more in depth here. So we're going to proceed with our meeting, but but it, we are certainly all cognizant of everything that's going on in the country right now. So having said that, can I get a movement for approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. All right, uh, shall I move? Vladimir seconded. Uh, Mr. Talio? Yes. Ms. Spicer? Yes. Mr. Vavich? Yes. Ms. Turke? Yes. I vote yes. Agenda approved five nothing. Uh, there was nothing to report out from closed session. No action was taken. So we'll move on to D4, recognition of retiring employees. Uh, Mr. Baer, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um, just uh, verifying, Marcy, are we, uh, are we prepared with all of our retirees and are they all here? I'm looking for them right now. Um, if you would like to start, we can start with Susan Evard. Great, and if they could, if you ask them to raise their hand, uh, it would be helpful, please. Thank you. All right, um, uh, this year we have a number of uh, retiree employees who have been with the school district for, um, for some time. And uh, it's always a bit of a sweet sorrow to see them go after so many years of contributing to our school district. Um, so we wanna take a few minutes to recognize uh, those, those people here tonight and uh, say a few words and allow the board to, uh, to recognize the service they've provided. So we're going to start with Susan Evard. Um, is, Susan, uh, is Susan here, Marcy? Sorry, it's a little strange. Yes, Susan, you should be able to unmute your mic and you should have access to your camera. And yes, for those other retirees here, please uh, raise your hands to make it easier to find you in the list. Um, I'm here and I've unmuted. Terrific, thank you. All right, Susan has been our um, secretary, school secretary at Covington. Uh, nice background, Susan. Uh, at Covington for, uh, is it 15 years, Susan? Uh, 15 years in the district, about 10 years as Covington secretary. Okay. And is that go-to person at the, at the front desk for, for Covington? Um, can always go to Susan for answers uh, for what's going on at Covington and really uh, is that person who uh, keep, keeps the ship sailing right even on, the, uh, on those tumultuous days. So uh, Susan's um, also been a parent in the school district. Um, her kids went through LASD, so she is really one of those um, community members who uh, we love to have in the school district and has provided so much. So Susan, we are going to miss you um, quite a bit, um, irreplaceable, but we wish you well as you, as you move on. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been, a, it's been a great 15 years, so it's a little bittersweet, but I'm ready to move on. All right, thank you. And normally I would hand you some flowers and give you a card. Um, you'll be getting you'll be getting something nice in the in the mail. So okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Um, who's up next? Let's do. Is Judy Azarello here? Next, we have Judy Azarello. Hi, Judy. Hi. Judy uh, is, has another school secretary, uh, has been the school secretary at Block for 15 years also, yes. has it been? Yes. We have a lot of people right at that 15 year mark tonight. 
Um, Judy's been there for, for 15 years um, as, again, just done a tremendous job as the, as the face of the school. I know she was school secretary when Sandra was at Block as, as principal as well. Um, and really does, uh, a middle school is a tremendously busy place with uh, busy adults and busy kids. And it really does take someone special to keep all that in order. And, and Judy's done a terrific job of that over the last 15 years. And again, we're sad to see you go, but very happy for you. And um, what lies what lies beyond for you? And I know you're moving out of the area and um, excited about that as well. So congratulations and thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Jeff. It was a privilege. You're muted, Jeff. Yeah. Sorry about that. Is Gail up next? Yes, next we have Gail Wade Gelfand. Hi, Gail. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Madame Wade is a, a French teacher and chorus teacher at, at Block. Um, and Gail, I know you've been teaching for more years than just at Block, right? Yes. But you've been at Block for? 22, 23, something like that. Yep, and really a, a mainstay of the block staff, um, that, that person that students go back to see. Um, Gail has led trips to, uh, to France, to Washington, D.C., was really the, um, the person holding that together for, um, for many years. And um, no, no. not D.C.? No, that was Mary. Oh, sorry, France. Um, but uh, I can always look forward to being invited to Gail's class and um, children greeting, uh, greeting one in French when they enter the room. And she was just all about uh, creating that, that immersive experience for uh, students as they learned a new language. And she was, Gail, so passionate about, um, about foreign language instruction and um, have just brought so much to kids at Block for many years. So thank you, Gail. Um, I've also appreciated your your travel tips as well. So um, we'll uh, continue to tap into you for that. But thank you and congrats, Sandra. I don't know if you wanna uh, say anything as well. I knew you, Gail was there when you were principal at Block as well. Yeah, I'll just add that it's, uh, Gail, your passion for your uh, music instruction also has been incredible with your regular chorus classes and your Block Appella that our kids have been so wonderfully lucky to be under your tutelage and to really uh, be the best versions of themselves. So thank you for everything, Gail. Thank you. Merci, Sandra. madame. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Who was up, Trisha McKenzie? Next we have Trisha McKenzie, yes. Excellent. Hi, Trisha, long time no see. Oh, you're muted, Trisha. So Trisha also has been at Block right around 14, 15 years. Is that right, 14? Um, Trisha teaches English. Um, another just passion, the, the, the most wonderful thing about uh, junior high school teachers is their uh, insane passion uh, for what they teach and for that age of children. And uh, Trisha certainly captures both of those. Um, she is an incredible English teacher, has taught journalism, uh, has dabbled in leadership as well, um, and is really, is really a go-to person on the block staff. Um, extremely high standards for kids and it, it, it pays dividends for them later, um, I can attest to. So um, uh, Trisha also is a, uh, an avid traveler as well and someone I can compare notes to and get uh, hot tips from uh, as well for travel and I've appreciated that too. But uh, really it's about her, the passion for her work at block and, and the excellence that she's brought to the the students there. So Trisha, we are going to miss you um, and appreciate everything you've done. Sandra? 
Uh, and I will miss my book buddy, even though I don't get to see you as often. I always know that I can reach out to you to for a great book suggestion, not only what you're reading, but what our kids are reading now. So thank you for everything, Trisha. Thank you. It's been great. <laughs> Thanks, Trisha. Congrats. And next we have Lisa Swarbrick. Hello. Hi, Lisa. Whoops, you can't see me. There we Not go. yet. There you are. <laughs> so, Lisa, I was uh, tabulating. You have been in the district since 2000 or uh, 90. I start with 1970 something when I was well, a student. <laughs> there is that as well. Uh, Curious fact or little known fact about Lisa, she and I graduated high school together um, in 1982 or thereabouts. Um, I will never tell. But Lisa has, uh, Lisa has um, really been someone who we've been able to call on to teach a range of grade levels uh, wherever was really necessary. And, um, you know, brought that, uh, brought that expertise to whichever school she was at and whichever grade level she was at. So um, be it at, uh, at Santa Rita or Loyola, um, uh, she, just, she just really brought that, that love of teaching and love of kids with her to the schools. And um, we, again, will miss you and appreciate everything you've done. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to still helping out. So great. I know you're still around. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. And next we have Jolene Walsh. Hi, Jolene, you there? Jolene is currently muted. I will see if we can unmute her. There she is. Hi, Jolene. Uh, Jolene has, this is year 30 in LASD, I believe, yes? I was hired in 1990. So That's amazing. I started the school year, this next school year, it would have been 30 years. So Jolene, too, has um, served in a few different roles. She uh, currently is a PE teacher, elementary grade PE teacher, um, has really brought a, an excitement and passion for that. Uh, if you haven't followed uh, Jolene and her, her pets on, on uh, her teaching, uh, you might want to do that. Uh, but <laughs> Jolene started at Bolus Parisima, yes? Mm -hmm. Back when Bullis Parisima was operating, then came down to Covington, um, has taught in a variety of grade levels, but is always excited about what she's doing. Uh, again, another one of those people who lives in the community as well. So she uh, uh, is, is not just a teacher in our schools, but she's a community member as well and has always brought excitement and joy with her and the kids notice it. And we're so appreciative of that. So we are going to miss you, Jolene. Uh, but wish you, the, wish you the very best. I'm sure we will still see you around. I want to say thank you um, to the board. And just for all my years as a, a teacher and a parent, I've always felt supported as a teacher. And I've always felt uh, as a parent that my children have gotten an amazing um, educational experience. So thank you very much. And Randy, I'll miss seeing you around. Um, but uh, I am I'm ready for new adventure. So here we come. All Ooh. right. I like your, um, oh, you can't see it, damn it. Uh, oh, oh <laughs> my sign, yes. <laughs> Somebody was throwing that away a long time ago and I kept it. I really, I, <laughs> I, I like it myself. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Jolene. Bye-bye. All right, and those are our six. There were uh, quite a number of years in there and quite, an, uh, quite a lot of expertise. Um, 
that that's leaving our district. Uh, but we always feel good that we are able to uh, to really capture new, exciting uh, folks as well who bring that same level of passion and same level of interest to our kids in our classroom. So uh, we'll certainly miss uh, that group of, of folks, but um, look forward to what lies ahead as well. Yeah, we certainly appreciate everybody's service. I know um, we have some other teachers leaving as well, probably not as long tenured, and we really appreciate all the service that, that all of them give, even though we don't have time to recognize them each individually. All right, um, D5, superintendent. Yeah, just a, a couple of items to make the, the board aware of. Um, we're going to, uh, Jennifer Kiker is, and I'm gonna join, is going to hold a, a special education parent meeting. Um, you are welcome to join as well. We'll send out that link to you. It's gonna be Wednesday at 4.30, uh, just to be able to present information and uh, share some updates and get the questions answered uh, from our parents of students with special needs. So again, Wednesday, the 3rd of June at 4.30. Um, and then I just want to also update you and make you aware our, student, our students on free or reduced lunch. Uh, we will continue service through the summer uh, for that. Uh, we're gonna work out a, a schedule, a work schedule for that for um, uh, for that to be staffed. Uh, Steve has been in, Steve Talio has been incredible out there uh, every day serving lunch, even in the pouring rain. Um, uh, but it's, you know, as this unfolds over the summer, we want to make sure that, that we have it well staffed. Um, and so, you know, we are, we are serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, to our students on free and reduced lunch. And we're doing that for seven days a week. Um, on Fridays, they get weekend meals as well. So um, again, that'll continue. So that's it, Brian. All right, um, thank you. So E, consent calendar. Uh, does anybody have any comments on the consent calendar or want to make a motion? Not everybody at once. I move to uh, uh, to that I move to uh, that we do E one through E three on the consent calendar. <laughs> I don't think I've ever moved for that. <laughs> In second, uh, second that okay. <laughs> right, motion by Jessica, second by Steve. <clears throat> um, I will do roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Vladimir. Yes. Shally? Yes. I vote yes. Consent calendar is passed five nothing. <clears throat> we'll move on to F, employee request to address the board. Uh, I believe Amanda Zhangyi is going to speak for LETA. Go ahead, you should be unmuted. Thank you, board and LATA community. Uh, my name is Amanda Zongi, and I am the union treasurer, and I'm also a special education teacher at Santa Rita. Um, LATA um, is excited to honor our retirees tomorrow at our end of the year uh, virtual celebration, and it's been really great to have those weekly town halls, and we greatly appreciate the communication. And we also hope that as the planning moves forward, that LETA um, hopes that teachers and students' safety is prioritized during the decision making. And we just wanna thank you again for everything that's gone on this year as the board and as you know, our administration has made a lot of tough decisions. So we thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Brian, can I just add one thing? Uh, um, Amanda mentioned tomorrow, Amanda, I think it's the ninth. Oh, uh, we're having Sorry. a celebration. Yep, no problem. Um, but we are having a, a celebration of our retiring employees at the town hall. We hold a weekly um, LASD staff town hall meeting and uh, on Tuesdays, and we're going to recognize our retirees on next Tuesday, June 9th.
All right, thank you. Um, I don't think we have anyone from CSEA. So uh, we're gonna move on to community comments. This time is reserved for the public to address the board on items not on the agenda. Community members wishing to address the board are allotted up to three minutes per speaker. Do we have anyone who wishes to address the board on any item not on the agenda? Uh, if you do up here on Zoom, you can raise your hand. I don't see anyone. Sorry, give me one second. Uh, okay, still not seeing anybody, so we will move on to action and discussion items. Item H1, Summer Learning for All in LASD. Mrs. McGonagall will present the plans for Summer Learning for All in LASD to be launched to families on June 1st, 2020. Go ahead, Tundra. That was last week's agenda item. Oh, whoops, sorry. Yeah. I have confused myself. <sighs> Reopening for the 2020-21 school year. I had a little panic moment. I was like, whoa. Sorry. Um, yes. That's the last week, this is this week. Mr. Bayer, go ahead. Yes, um, so we, uh, I'm gonna have uh, our Director of Communications, Sarah Stern Benoit, uh, join on this to be available for any questions as she, uh, she monitored and uh, tabulated and created the survey. But wanted to give you an overview. We, uh, as, as part of our effort to uh, continue to refine our work, and uh, look forward to what the plans for fall may be, um, which we're still not sure of yet, but we wanted to make sure that we took, um, took feedback from three groups, our, our students, our teachers, and our families to understand both what their experience was uh, through these last 10 weeks of virtual school and any areas that they could identify for uh, improvement. So um, you're going to hear, you're going to hear uh, results from those three groups and the, the feedback was dense and we've, it closed on Friday. We've, uh, we have compiled it um, in the last couple of days and uh, look to give you overview of each of the survey groups and then some uh, common threads that we identified, and then looking at uh, the go forward. So next slide, Marcy. Um, first with our students, we surveyed our students in grades three through six for this particular survey. Uh, Bob Nunarula and Keith Rocha, the principals at, at Egan and Block, uh, also have surveyed their seventh and eighth graders. Uh, we don't have that included in here yet. But we had, of our third through sixth graders, we had uh, just over 1,400 participate, which was a solid number. It was assigned to them, so there was uh, uh, some good reason for their to, them to complete it. So next, uh, next slide, just an overview of schools that were represented. Um, good representation there across our district. Next. Uh, grade levels represented. Again, pretty uh, appropriate distribution there. Um, and then the next one, we just checked in with how they were, next slide, how they were feeling. Um, just kind of a one through five, I'm feeling bad, please check in on me so I'm doing great. Um, generally, our students are doing well. Uh, those that indicated they're feeling bad, please check in. We're doing follow-ups. Uh, with those students to see how how we can help. But generally, a uh, 4.1 rating, which is, is pretty strong. Our kids are, uh, in general, um, holding up well during this, uh, during this sheltering in place. Next slide. Uh, question six asked about whether or not students, what their perception was, do they have a daily schedule for work at home that works for them? 
80, almost 85% said yes, uh, they do. So that's a, that's a strong number. We're glad that the routine has um, uh, been solidified at home. Next slide. Next slide asks whether they have a, a way to contact their teacher if they have questions. And you can see the range of responses there. Um, I've emailed my teacher and received help. Over 70% of them um, posted a question in Google Classroom and received help. 40% have done that. Uh, other resources, and then I haven't needed help. So uh, students appear to understand how to uh, reach out for that help if they've needed it. Uh, next. This one's about how much time they're spending doing schoolwork. Um, and this one was asked about each day this week, the week they took it, which was last week. Um, you can see the, the majority of students are spending about two to four hours. Um, it's not quite a bell-shaped curve, but you know, it's a 77%, 78% are in that two to six hour range. Um, a few spending more than six and 17, almost 17% spend less than two hours um, each day. So next slide. This is just a general um, feeling question, a perception question. How does the work level feel to you? Uh, this one's pretty bell-shaped. 73% um, feel like it's about right. 15 are stressed, it's too much work, and then 10% feel like there's not enough work. All right, next. How much help have you been able to get from adults or older siblings at home? So the range here was uh, from the green bar that I don't get any help uh, to the orange being pretty uh, solid that someone's available when I need that help. Um, you can see this came at, in at 3.9 um, as an average. So um, it is definitely skewing toward the students are getting help uh, when they need help. Okay, next slide. Uh, I connect with my friends and teachers to learn together in a virtual classroom. Again, the range often, sometimes not at all often and sometimes being the overwhelming um, response with 94% uh, saying that they often or sometimes uh, connect with friends and teachers to learn together in a virtual classroom. 6% um, saying not at all. Okay, next slide. This one was an open-ended response. What's the best part about virtual school? Uh, these five were the most frequent um, types of answers as they were uh, reviewed and evaluated. Uh, you can see that the best parts that students felt were that flexibility of schedule, ability to learn at their own pace, <laughs> go to school in their pajamas, um, able to sleep more was a positive, recognized positive for them. Uh, it's less work uh, was a common response. More time with family which was a positive response as well, we felt. Uh, they also liked the Google Meets, that FaceTime with teachers and friends, you know, that social interaction that they're craving during a time like this. And um, they really felt like they were still learning to, despite their not being school, right? I assume that means in-person school. Uh, next, when we asked students about the hardest part about virtual school, these are the social things. Uh, missing friends was very uh, frequent. Uh, it's hard to get help from the teacher, long response time for help, staying on task, uh, missing that working with a teacher in person. Uh, too much work and too hard was a, a, a common response. Uh, some felt nothing was hard about it. Tech issues were an issue and then just that general, similar to the first response, just missing being at school. And then 14, what do you miss most about being at school? Friends, of course, the answer we would expect. Teachers, 
uh, recess and playground time that ties closely to friends. Uh, and then just being in that classroom, that social environment. So these really speak to the, the social elements of school being, being missed. Okay, so if we roll forward. Uh, 177 total responses. Sarah, do you, are you there, Sarah? I am here. What's the 1210? Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to fix that. Uh, let me look for that number and I'll, I'll get back to you. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, thank you. All right, moving ahead. So 177 teachers out of 225 or so, it's a strong response. Uh, you can see that the responses came from across the grade levels. Next slide. Across the schools. And next, uh, we asked what's going well for students from the teacher's viewpoint. Live class meetings, uh, just the whole, the uh, LMS, the learning management system of Google Classroom, Google Meets, which is similar to live class meetings. One-on-one uh, -on -one time with students, that would be through Google Meet as well. And then also teamwork with colleagues, uh, sharing the load, figuring this out together uh, was, a, was another common response. Uh, looking at the next question, additional support needed to effectively teach. Uh, this is kind of that prospective look. What else do we need? Uh, tech training, additional device, equipment, or tools. Uh, student and parent engagement, parent communication uh, was something that uh, was a common answer from teachers. They need planning time uh, to go forward and, and elevate their work. Uh, other additional student supports for those students who might be struggling or were having a harder time uh, connecting with, and then guidance on curriculum. And we think that one's really tied to this idea that uh, in this environment, it's, it is uh, difficult to address all content areas to the same degree as when in person so that guidance on what is most critical. All right, moving on. We asked about some specific areas if they felt they needed additional training in it with any of these tools. Um, the one that really stood out is this idea of um, video recording as well as uh, Google Classroom was probably the next along with Google Slides, but video recording uh, stood out, we think that's something that's really taking up a, um, a great deal of teacher time. Moving ahead, uh, this asked about, do they have the technology, do they have the equipment or technology to perform their duties? Um, I think we have found that Wi-Fi and internet connection has, became an issue for some as we were pushing to do more and more live work. Um, also problems with devices uh, that aren't functioning properly. That's, uh, that's at, at their homes where they're, where they're working from. Uh, and then specific training with, uh, with particular devices is also one. Next slide. All right, this one. Ask, asking about collaboration, right? A, a vital part of what we do is really uh, working together as educators to um, refine our work and uh, kind of compare notes. So are you able to collaborate? And overwhelming, yes. Able to meet every week, discuss ideas and share the load. Everyone's pitching in. That was almost 72%. And then another 16 responded with uh, when when necessary, yes, they do. And you can see the answers that follow 7% wishing they could meet more often and uh, only 5% roughly feel like they're not meeting often enough and feel like they're on their own. All right, number question 10 um, is asking about that manageability of this workload, right? recording videos, checking in with students, small group meetings, office hours, grade level meetings. Is this manageable? Uh, you can see the 
strongest responses were kind of in the sort of range from kind of. There are some days I feel like it's too much. And then for the most part, I feel like I can manage it. That's about 76% of our teachers, 10% saying all's great, 14%, they just can't get, sustain this. All right, number 11. So this is asking, this is really getting at the idea of was it a lot of work in the beginning as you were getting this thing off the ground, but now it's become more manageable, right? We wanted to get at that idea. And you can see just under 60% agreed with that idea that the workload has become more manageable over time. Um, another almost 8% say no, it's even more difficult to manage now. Uh, 25, 24%, it's about the same. Manageable, it's about the same as it always was. And then another almost 10% saying it's about the same, unmanageable. So looking at that, we've got 17% of um, our teachers feeling like it isn't manageable and uh, what 83% on the other side. All right, next, asking about how much time they spend in a live session with students each week. Um, you can see over 40%, 10 or more hours. And you can see how it rolls down from there down to under four hours, about 13% of our uh, of our teachers. So this is something that you know, Sandra and I have looked at and talked about already today. Uh, question 13, what are you doing in these live sessions? And this, this they could have chosen them all if they're doing all of them, right? Uh, but you can see the types of activities, 85% of our teachers are all doing community building, targeted instruction and answering student questions. 65% uh, are doing some form of direct instruction. Um, and question 14, what's their prep time look like each week? Uh, this is just the time preparing to be online um, with kids in, one, in whatever they're doing. So you can see that uh, over 50%, 57% are spending more than 10 hours preparing. And then it rolls down from there um, under four hours. We have 6% of our teachers in preparation for online teaching. Okay, next slide. How much time they spend commenting on student work and e emailing parents, right? This is kind of that, uh, that feedback idea. Um, and you can see the breakdown there. Again, the scale is still the same from under four hours, five to six, seven to eight, more than 10 hours. If you compare the last two slides, you can see that the, the uh, proportion of responses evens out. Uh, there's more time being spent preparing. Uh, overall, less time being spent commenting on student work and emailing parents. This is another uh, area Sandra and I talked about because this really has to do with feedback and assessment and um, helping kids understand how they're progressing. All right, next question uh, asks about whether they feel supported by their team, by administration, by the teachers association, et cetera, if some sort of issue arises. This feedback is, is pretty strong uh, with zero saying not at all, um, up to a high saying, yes, I feel supported and together we're able to resolve issues with 57%. Happy to see that zero people said not at all. All right, moving on. This is just getting at their state of mind, how they're feeling right now. Um, and you can see two thirds of the teachers, exactly, said uh, on most days I feel good, some days are more difficult than others. Um, only 5% said they're overwhelmed and most days are very difficult emotionally. And 22% feeling good, happy and healthy to knowing that this is all difficult. All right, moving on. 
question 18. This is getting at this idea of whether or not they're taking care of themselves, uh, self-care. They could have answered any or all of these. It's asking about what they have in place to make sure they're taking care of themselves. Uh, you can read through the responses there. All right, next. Uh, again, this is looking forward, asking them about what measures would need to be in place to make them feel safe to return to work. Again, check all that apply. Um, so the first five uh, get at um, processes, protocols, equipment we can have in place, social distancing, um, more cleaning, uh, protective equipment, reducing class sizes, no large group activities, all garnered strong support. Um, I think of note here is that we do have 20% of teachers at this time who are reporting that they're not comfortable returning to the classroom and if they're given the option to teach virtually, that's what they'd like to do. All right, next. Uh, kind of getting at a similar um, a, a similar question or similar thinking. If the district is able to open all campuses to all students in August, we want to know what statement describes their mindset. And you can see so almost 73% say they're ready and understand there's going to be social distancing requirements. Uh, almost 25% say that they're nervous, similar to the last uh, question, that they're nervous due to their personal circumstances and may need assistance. And then others say, I would consider retirement, resignation, or taking a leave of absence if we're opening all campuses to all students in August. And that represents three people. All right, moving on. Um, it's kind of at the other end. If the district needs to continue with 100% virtual school model in the fall, we want to know the statement that does, uh, best describes their mindset. Uh, strong response for that first one, that they're ready. And with additional training, they'll be fine. 92%, that is a powerful number. So um, feel really good about our teachers and their mindset there and where they are. Uh, you can see 6% say that they're struggling, that they feel like they're struggling more than their, their colleagues and they're gonna need even more assistance. And then again, if we're back 100% virtual, we have two, per pe two people who will say that they'd consider retirement or taking a leave of absence. All right, 22, uh, if the district opens in a hybrid instructional model, right, which means somewhere in between those two bookends of we're all back physically or we're 100% virtual, some kind of uh, hybrid of the two. Again, we're asking about their mindset and they could have selected any or all of these. Um, if given the option, I'd choose to teach 100% virtual. If given the option, I'd choose to teach 100% live and they'd be comfortable splitting the time between virtual and uh, live. So it gives us a sense of where, where people's sentiments are. Um, moving forward, we'll talk about what's next a little bit later. Um, our parent survey here, um, we had over 1,700 responses from parents, which was great, um, stronger than we typically have, which is appreciated. Um, especially on a quick turnaround, because uh, we were looking to cycle this information because we know that we may need to ask additional information based on the information we get here. So uh, next slide, we had a pretty good distribution of um, grade levels represented, which is nice. Uh, next, good representation of schools as well. Uh, next, question three. Um, does your child follow a set schedule for work on academics? Um, and you can see the responses there, 60% yes, 
twelve and a half percent say no, and uh, sometimes it's probably an understandable answer here. Um, another twenty seven twenty eight percent saying sometimes. Uh, next. This is asking about the amount of daily time your child spends in virtual school. Uh, you can see about half say just the right amount. 37% too little work, 11 and almost 12% too much work. So not quite a bell-shaped curve here, right? We would expect a little, a bit less in the too little and a bit more in the too much if we, you know, see that typical bell-shaped curve. Um, one might think that indicates we need to move just a little bit to uh, um, increasing the amount of daily time that, that students are spending in virtual school. Uh, question five, um, this is about asking parents their sentiments on whether their child is aware of the daily expectations by their teacher. Uh, ranging from not aware to very aware. And we came in with a 4.1 rating, which is, which is strong. Um, that indicates that in general, kids are pretty aware of the daily expectations. Uh, next, this one was an open-ended and asking about what's gone well in virtual school from a parent's perspective. Um, you can see student independence. Uh, they like the flexibility and schedule, the ability to go at their own pace and there being fewer distractions. Uh, many positive comments about teacher work and lessons and going above and beyond, which uh, we're very aware of and appreciative of. Uh, they talked about going well, the live experiences for students, Google Meets, office hours, one-on-one -on -one help, uh, morning meetings, reading groups, read alouds, all these variety of live experiences, and then connecting with other students, right? That sense of community um, are things that have gone well for some people. Um, here are a couple examples. Uh, we asked for uh, any examples of uh, uh, great things that have happened or, or positive assignments. And I'll just let you read there. And next, there's a couple more. All right, so those were nice to read positives. Moving on to question eight, Marcy. Uh, this was, where does, the, where does your child need the most support and encouragement with virtual school, right? Um, and this could be, they could have chosen all seven of these um, if they wanted, uh, but you can see some of those organization with schoolwork, setting a daily schedule, connecting with friends, that social piece comes up again. Um, it is absolutely, we recognize one of the challenges of this distance situation. Um, asking for support from the teacher, overall stress, and then my child feels connected and supported. So some of these were already, certainly already on our radar. Um, this whole idea of organization, uh, what we call executive functioning, uh, is something that we know um, we need more explicit uh, instruction with if we are going to be in this situation again. Uh, that idea of setting a daily schedule as well is important. So some of these were helpful to hear uh, validated and um, voiced by parents. Uh, the next question, question nine, uh, my child's amount of academic work is, you can see, just, just right, not enough too much. Um, about half saying it's just right. And again, you can see uh, that the scale is tipped a bit toward the not enough versus the, the too much. So that's, uh, that's useful feedback for us as well. Question 10, uh, this is about um, 
the parent's perspective of their child's level of classroom community experiences. Um, again, 40% saying it's uh, just right, 58% saying not enough. Uh, I think this really um, emphasizes the point that in a distance learning situation, those community experiences are, are what are missing, what are probably the most difficult to get at, and what, what parents are recognizing uh, in their point of view is, is uh, one of the bigger things that, that's missing. Question 11, uh, this one has to do with opportunities for children to receive uh, individual attention. Um, so again, just right, over half, not enough, 44%. We only had two people respond that there, were, there was too much opportunity for a child to receive individual attention from the teacher. So um, again, this gets at that, uh, that idea of uh, personal interactions and good feedback as well. Question 12, um, wondering, asking about whether their children are struggling emotionally or socially in virtual school. Um, 57, 58% no, 42% yes. Um, about half in the right direction, right? A little more than half, but we certainly would want to find out more and see what we can do to address that. Uh, next, are our children struggling academically? Uh, much stronger, right? 71% to 29%. No, they're not struggling academically. So it appears to be less concern from parents about the academic struggle than there is about the, the social emotional uh, to be expected. Uh, next question, 14. Um, we asked about some resources that, we, that we've, we have pushed out our docents living classroom STEM. Have they used them? Uh, did you find them helpful? Small percentage of people said yes, uh, but those who did found them engaging and helpful. There's a low level of awareness, we believe. Um, comments expressed frustration. This is an important one, I think, about uh, those being optional. Um, I, I think this gets at the idea, uh, just as I've emailed back and forth with a, a few parents, there is a difference between uh, the parent uh, requiring a, a, a child to do this and a teacher requiring a, a student to do whatever assignment it is, right? Uh, uh, I have certainly recalled these, uh, these days that the teachers do carry a bit more gravitas um, when, when it comes to this. So that's something we want to look at as well. Uh, there was too much parent involvement required and just not enough time for extra work. Either parent or child is available in their day. Uh, question 15, asking what other resources parents would find helpful. Um, most frequent was more frequent and quality teacher feedback. Parents want to understand their children's progress. They want to know um, more about that, you know, kind of that window into assignments and schedules. Uh, they'd like to see more live teaching, um, synchronous, small group, one-on-one -on -one with teacher, tutoring, extra help, any, all of those. Uh, it gets to those live interactions. Um, this was mentioned earlier, but the executive functioning skills for students, that's organization and prioritizing skills, uh, more social, fun opportunities. This gets at that social emotional need. They'd like to see more non-screen work. Um, certainly there's been concern about kids spending so much time in front of a screen uh, in these situations. And it is a tricky balance that we, uh, that we work to address. And like all of us, there is a strong desire to get back on campus physically. Uh, moving ahead, uh, question, 16, 17, these were very similar. There were, there were similar responses to the last, uh, wanting more teacher feedback, more communication on student progress, parents wanna help their kids, more live uh, interaction, more social, 
uh, more time spent on schoolwork uh, or, or in virtual school for kids. That, uh, as, as we read those, that doesn't necessarily mean in front of a screen, but it just means more time dedicated to the work. They would like to see their kids working more. Um, and not surprising, many voices strong desire to go back to campus. So moving ahead to the last few, uh, what measures would need to be in place for you, for you to feel safe having your children return to school in August, right? This is akin to the question we asked the teachers, but we asked this of parents for their kids. Uh, you can see um, they, you know, the, that social distancing, uh, protective equipment, small class sizes, reduced events are all seem to be expectations. Um, and almost 18% of our parents at this point in time indicate that they are not comfortable sending their kids back to school in the fall physically. Uh, so the next question, this is uh, kind of the inverse uh, in a way. If we need to continue with a 100% virtual school model in the fall, what statement best describes your current mindset? Uh, we have 56 who said they're ready and continue, will continue. Um, another 17 said they need additional assistance if this were to happen. And uh, 20, almost 27% said that it's gonna be a hardship for the family. Uh, if my, if their kids can't attend school on campus next year. I think this gets to that idea that parents are uh, heading back to work. They have work obligations. This worked as an emergency um, measure, but if we're talking about a longer term, this is going to be uh, difficult for them. Uh, question 20, if schools can open campuses to all students in August, choose the statement that best describes your current mindset. You can see 78%, uh, over 78 and a half, that they're ready and understand there's gonna be all kinds of requirements, social distancing and otherwise, that their children and school staff are gonna to need to follow. Um, uh, almost 4% said that they're gonna need additional assistance to be able to attend school in the fall. And that same roughly 17 to 18% said they'd prefer their child to attend virtual school if it's offered instead of returning to campus. All right, moving ahead to 21. We asked a bit about communication, where parents are getting their information. Uh, you can see uh, where parents are indicating they get that. That's for our uh, communication use. So we know which are the critical pieces that parents are really paying attention to. Good for us to know. And then next is just a couple of slides compiling. Um, next slide, Marcy. So the consistent themes across all three groups. There is a want for more social interaction between students and teachers, be it small group, one-to-one, -one, whole group, community building, student-to-student -student interaction, whatever it is, there's a want for more live interaction. Uh, we recognize also that this distance learning is difficult for many of our families. Uh, we also see that distance learning has provided some benefits. Uh, there was a, enough, enough indicating that the flexibility, right, of not having to be right there at a given time was useful for family situations. It allowed for additional family time and it created greater independence in their kids. But most would certainly appear or uh, prefer to be back on campus. Um, as we took away the feedback on the next slide of ways to improve the virtual school model, um, we recognize full well that we cannot replicate the entire in school experience. And we also recognize that, and I think it's important to say out loud that our preference as a school district is to have kids back on campus uh, in person with teachers, right? That's our preferred option when it's safe. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some consistent uh, uh, threads for improvement, more teacher feedback and progress updates to families. Um, 
wanting parents wanting to know about uh, tools to assess student progress in learning in virtual school. How can they know how their kids are doing? There's a want for more live teaching, uh, be it small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, full class, social time, uh, time to engage with peers. Uh, there's a want to improve consistency in student experience with live instruction across the district. I, I think that that's the takeaway from that from that slide where some students are spending far more time than others in live situations. How can we, how can we um, equalize that? Uh, faster response time to assist students with questions. How can we, how can we improve that? Uh, this want for executive functioning and time management for students. Uh, th there was, there was uh, examples of students in this situation need to understand how to properly construct an email if they want to ask their teacher for help, those sorts of things. Um, but all of those executive functioning items need additional attention. Uh, tech support, training improvements for teachers, students, and parents. And then um, some training for teachers to improve efficiency and improve that on online learning experience for kids, right? This is as we move from emergency teaching to a more thoughtful, well-planned distance learning approach. All right, and is that the last one, Marcy? I think that's the last slide. All right, so that was our uh, survey of the three groups. Brian, I will hand it back to you for, uh, for next steps, questions from the board, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, so uh, next we'll take any board questions on the presentation before we move to public comment. So any board members who wish to ask questions? No, don't see any, all right. Um, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Uh, prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on and each speaker will be given three minutes. Give everybody a moment. I'm not seeing any hands. Seeing no public comment, we will move back to board discussion. Who would like to open the commenting? Anybody? I will. <laughs> Usually. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I, I know that the rest of the board feels the same way, but we, we need to thank our teachers enormously for the work that they've been doing. It's, um, it's over and above what other districts uh, are experiencing. And um, I know that we're very, very happy that they have done so. And to reiterate again, um, the, the fabulous work that they've been doing. Um, I have a couple of comments about individual uh, uh, questions here. Um, and um, I guess the, the, the I'll hold off on them. Um, the only thing I wanted to say was, I think that, uh, at least for me, the reflection that we don't have enough person-to-person -person contact is a big issue. And I don't know how that can be solved uh, in distance learning, because the very nature of distance learning is that there's no person-to-person uh, -person contact. Um, so I, I think we're in, we're sort of caught in a, in uh, an unsolvable situation here. That's all. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, this was quite an exhaustive survey. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, I just, uh, there's a couple of things that jumped out at me that kind of worried me a little bit. So. For example, in the student, the, the questionnaire that went to the students, and I didn't write down the question number, but it's kind of early, uh, about setting up a daily schedule. And 15% of the students said that they didn't have a daily schedule. And uh, in the parent survey, a similar question, 12% of parents said that there was no daily schedule. And I'm just kind of curious as to why, or is there a way that we can help our 
students? I mean, if we do go into some sort of virtual learning format in the fall, I think maybe part of the training we need to give our kids is how to set up a daily schedule. Like, it's, it's, it's a bit of self-discipline and I'm just kind of wondering how we can support our kids. Um, the other one on the student survey, question 12, uh, it's about connecting with friends and teachers to learn in virtual school. Um, I was really concerned that 81 kids said not at all. And I'm not really sure why or if you have any insight into why. Is it a, an issue with having the proper uh, device tech, you know, connecting to the internet? Or is it something else, you know, that they're feeling more isolated and don't know how to reach out? So I was kind of worried about that. And then kind of similarly in the teacher survey, uh, question nine, uh, six teachers felt like they're on their own and another nine teachers said that they wanted to meet with their peers more. Um, it kind of, kind of made me feel very sad that teachers feel like they're on their own and they're unsupported. And I don't know if there's a way of following up with the teachers who responded, those 15 teachers, to see why, like just to go a little bit deeper into how that, why they answered that way in those questions. That's it. Brian, do you want comments? <clears throat> yes, by all means. Okay. Sandra, do you want to comment on a couple yeah, of those? Sure. Um, Shali, we are planning, we have a running list of uh, kind of supports that we can build centrally for students around executive function for the start of the, of the school year. If we're in a hybrid or an online system around scheduling, around kind of just basic communication, you know, how do I communicate with adults in my system? How can we help them function better within the system that we want to create and we are working on creating a more aligned organizational system so it feels familiar teacher to teacher um, and school to school which i think will help teachers uh, and uh, students especially feel like they have a better handle on what that looks like and um, families too yeah, oh, and families, absolutely, who we know right now have, many have multiple children with different teachers and or at multiple school sites and have been kind of juggling what those different systems look like. So we are working around some alignment in those systems and we'll be able to support um, students better. I'm trying to look at my notes. Um, I think the, the question that, you know, that the number of students that they're not, that they're not not at all uh, uh, connecting, right? Um, and I, I don't know if that's an overstatement because we have contacted every one of our students, but it's that whether they are regularly um, tuning in, if you will, right? And I think some of our teachers have uh, provided lots of optional times for kids to connect but I think it went to one of those earlier slides, right? If it's optional, we certainly have students who are going to choose not to opt in and then the t parent is feeling frustrated because they want their child to connect, but the kid doesn't want to. So that's something we're definitely working on increasing the amount for next year, if we are hybrid or online of that um, required connections. And I think with the, 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 the last one you brought up, Shelly, that, you know, the, the number of teachers feeling like they're on their own, right? I know Sandra is um, really working because we've just discussed it a number of times that this, how can we create that time for teachers to have that a regular time for teachers to, to work together and collaborate and share the load in developing or delivering this, right? Um, because there is collect work that can be done collectively to really lighten the load for all. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, I think because we went in so quickly into kind of the emergency remote teaching, teachers established their schedules, right? They just kind of started because we had to start and nobody really knew exactly what it was gonna look like or how long we were going to be in it. 
And at some point when we realized it was going on a little bit longer, perhaps than we had anticipated at the, art, um, at the onset, um, those typical times where we always met Thursday afternoons, right? But I have scheduled my weekly meetings Thursday afternoons suddenly, and so I don't have time to meet with my team. And instead of reconfiguring everything, I think it's about looking forward to seeing how we can be more systematic about providing that absolutely necessary time. Thank you. Jessica? Um, I want to reiterate what Vladimir had to say. I'm just uh, amazed at all the work our teachers have done. And honestly, what every community member has done, what, what the kids have done in all of this, what our parents have done at home, um, having, I am an LASD parent of two kids and it's not easy, um, but I also know that these te the teachers are dealing with something they've never had to deal with before. Um, and I know my kids have their days and that are good, that are bad, just like we do. Um, so just really good job, everyone. Um, I'm very thankful for everybody's participation in this. Um, as it relates to the you know, ways to improve the LASD uh, virtual school, um, perhaps we could kind of go through exact uh, or any sort of input you have as to what you have been doing. I know Shally covered some of it um, in her questions, but um, what kind of tools are you looking to assess student progress in virtual school? Um, what are our plans for uh, you know, the more live teaching in small groups, et cetera. Basically all the bullet points, any more input you can give on that, Sandra, would be great. Well, I'll, I'll, start, up by, I'll yeah. start up by saying that everything you just asked about is in progress. So <laughs> there's, there's not a, I'm you know, my sure. point is that there's not, there's not an answer, a final answer yet on that. I'm sure there's no final answer, any sort of progress. Uh, I, I will share, you know, we just launched our professional development modules today for teachers because we realize that they have amazing in-person classroom skills. And so we're really trying to expand uh, those skills into an online system, right, thoughtfully. So we do have teachers over the next eight days working through a series of modules around how do I better engage students through whole group, small group, and target or you know individual instruction? And what are some tools and strategies for that? How do how can I? There's a whole module around providing feedback for students that is efficient on the teacher and informative for the student. Um, we've got a whole module looking at the survey data on building better instructional videos and providing some greater engagement for an instructional video. So we are working through a lot of that professional learning right now with teachers and some of them right today was day one. So they're, they've barely dipped their toes into that. Um, but it is uh, uh, something that we plan on really kind of launching more heavily next year, should we need to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Steve? Yeah, um, so I, I think I, I want to leverage up a couple of things both Vladimir and, um, and Jessica touched on, which is I think the work that's gone on to get us this far is pretty amazing. And the, 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 the effort that's gone in to get us here. And let's rem remind ourselves that this is, reflects basically eight weeks of work um, that we've gone to try to ramp from zero to what we've done. Um, and I think this, this really provides us the foundation for the work that Sandra is currently doing on how do we do the fall? Because this, this really does inform fall decisions that we're making now. And, and I think as we hear that coming back, we as board members should hang out of this information to help us evaluate what, what, what are we gonna say yes to and what do we think the structure of fall will look like? Because um, I think that's really what I use this, this data from is that, that foundational sort of thought process of we know what works, what didn't work, what do we need to be adjusting to make this work in a longer term situation. So if, if that's, if, if the feedback is as, as strong as it is, um, that you did well, I, I want to take that away as the foundation for me that you did well in a, in a short period of time, turning the switch, getting things going, you did well. Um, now we have to tweak to get better and let's figure out what the model is. And then once we figure out the model, tweak more. 
so that we can all feel very comfortable in delivery moving forward. But I think the results here to me really say the work that was done zero to 60 or whatever you want to call it um, was pretty phenomenal. And so thank you to everyone who made that work happen. And I, I view this more as a an adjustment to a model than a scrap and start over, which is what we could have gotten in terms of feedback and we didn't, which I'm, I'm happy to see. So thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, so I agree. I think with just about everything that everyone else has said, um, I just, um, a couple of comments and questions. Um, I, I would like to get some kind of assessment of sort of on a curriculum basis, how well we thought we did and and how well teachers think we can do in terms of, you know, go, I mean, I realized that this spring was an emergency situation. So certainly not in the interest of casting blame or anything, but just informationally um, to try to sort of see what the gap that we're gonna have to make up looks like. Um, and then going forward, I think that's sort of part of, of whatever we come up with is we've got to make sure we understand what the, cap what the capacity is in terms of delivering curriculum. Um, I was a little actually surprised in retrospect that the, the questions about what measures would need to be in place didn't include sort of regular testing of teachers and staff um, and possibly students. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you, have you had any sort of further conversations with either our internally our health staff or, or externally with the county about um, getting testing in place? Because it's one thing that they're starting to talk about um, more urgently around you know, sort of frontline and at-risk employees is sort of setting up a regime for, for regular testing. Right. Um, we, I have not heard back on that, that yet, Brian. Um, I know our health services staff is investigating that. Okay. Um, I mean, that's something I think we should certainly look into, right, is whether we can get essentially dedicated testing resources to make sure that we can raise everybody's comfort level um, as much as we can. Um, similarly, actually, and this is a random thought, that doesn't really need a response. Um, but a lot of the calls that we've been on have been emphasizing that preventative uh, medical care, you know, has basically always been open and should certainly not be overlooked. So I wonder if it would be worth reaching out, especially about vaccinations to our parent populations um, over the summer, just to make sure that, that we don't run into something unexpected there of, of things not being done until the very last minute because people don't realize that it's required and haven't been visiting their pediatrician as frequently as they otherwise would. Um, so I know I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know going to some grades, state law requires certain vaccines. And I just want to make sure that we're out in front of that in this whole unusual situation. Um, and then, yeah, go ahead, Vladimir. Um, I just wanted to uh, elaborate on, on something that you said there. Um, I think it would be worthwhile for us to be clear on what goals we have for um, either hybrid or virtual schools um, for both students, for parents, and, and also for teachers. Um, I don't, I certainly don't expect anything to happen uh, along those lines. What goals are we going to try to meet until uh, after uh, professional development and after teachers have had a chance to look at what the options are. So later on in the summer, uh, perhaps even up beginning in the fall, but I, at one point, I think we do need to think about um, what is it we can do um, and what are our goals in that area? And, and some clarity on that would be really nice, I think. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Um, and to that end, I mean, as, as has been referenced, this is very much a work in progress and we're um, we've done, actually, thank you again to Sandra. I, I think we're ahead of where a lot of districts are in terms of starting to try to figure these things out, but there's a long way to go. Um, and so Jeff and I have been talking about um, putting more meetings onto our calendar um, at this point, because I expect that this will evolve, the whole situation will evolve. Um, and I wanna make sure that, that we as a board and the community in general are kept in the loop. Um, so Jeff, do you wanna talk about that or? Have you had a chance to yeah. vet those dates? Yeah, no, I, I uh, looked at the, um, just at the, at the calendar and when these might fit, uh, knowing that there's gonna be um, quite a bit to discuss with regard to program uh, budget as we get further down the road. Um, I think adding a couple of meetings uh, later this month, um, I've 
we, we've talked to you previously about this idea. Uh, Sandra and I both believe that um, by the end of June, we really need to make a decision as to what the instructional program is going to be um, because we do need to give time uh, and notice to our teachers in order to prepare for that. And the earlier we can do that, the better. Um, even in terms of just being settled with what the what the decision is good because right now there is a, a bit of understandably anxiety around what's the fall going to look like um, also realize that when we make that uh, commitment that we will flex it right based on the the uh, the public health department orders but I think uh, it, so for looking at the 29th as the date that we would like the board to um, approve the go forward plan for the fall. I think we'll also need to add the 22nd as a, a date as well, because we'd like to bring, bring you information um, about program, have an opportunity for you to react to it, public have an opportunity to react to it, take some feedback and then come back on the 29th and hopefully get a, um, a go ahead. Um, so the 22nd and 29th of June, and then I think you'd also like to just place hold uh, the 13th and 27th of July. Um, if we don't need those dates, then of course we won't meet, but knowing that there's a great deal going on uh, in, our, in our community and in our county, I think it would be good to have those set aside. So June 22, 29, and July 13 and 27. I'll also just put out there that, that um, Santa Clara County Office of Education has a, uh, a similar survey uh, out to what we sent to our parents. Um, that one, I think we're gonna include that in a, in, um, a communication to our community, but they are they are gathering information to be able to ultimately share with public health department. I think on what the sentiment of the of the community is as well. So uh, look for that coming up, and that's it. Uh, that's I have a question for Randy. Oh, sorry. Um, Randy, when do we hear from the governor on um, the? quote, final budget. So they need to adopt the budget um, by the, I think it's the middle of June in order for the legislation to, the legislators to get paid. So we should have an adopted budget within a couple of weeks from now. State adopted budget. But, well, we can talk about more about this in the budget item, but they've also said it's not gonna be final this year. Jessica, do you have something? Oh, I was just going to say we should try to also share our survey results of our community with the county because it's a more of an exhaustive uh, survey. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Um, I assume nobody, no board members had conflicts or any issues with any of those dates. I'll be vacationing point. that whole time. Well, fortunately, this year you can call in from wherever you are without any extra hassle. Vacation from our backyard. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, any further questions, comments? All right. Thank you, Jeff and Sandra. And we'll move on to H2, Citizen Advisory Committee for Finance Annual Report. Mr. Kenyon. Yep. Um, our Citizens Finance Committee has continued meetings since they presented a mid-year report to you in January. Um, and tonight for their annual report, uh, there's two committee members, Fred Gallagher, who's the current chair, and Curtis Cole, who is past chair, will present their uh, end of the year report. Uh, we normally we call it the annual report, but this year they may do some additional work over the summer, depending on what's happening with finances and come back to you in the early fall. But uh, here, here, here they are now tonight. And I think we're gonna start with Fred when he's ready to go. Thank you, Marcy, for putting the slides up. 
Yep, good to go. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, thanks to the board and the district staff for the opportunity to present the CACF presentation tonight. Uh, Fred Gallagher here, current chair of uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee for Finance. And as Randy mentioned, Curtis uh, Cole is going to assist in the presentation tonight. Uh, there's Curtis. Um, so just a word about CACF, as you know, in 1989, voters approved a ballot measure which allows the district to tax property owners a per parcel assessment. We now call that the parcel tax. Uh, each year, the district provides a specific accounting of how parcel tax monies are spent. CACF is charged with reviewing that specific accounting. In addition to that service, uh, CACF uh, performs financial and scenario analyses to assist the district and the board of trustees um, outside of that. Um, so that latter function is where we're gonna spend uh, our time tonight. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, just by way of reference, um, 10 days ago, the state of, a Cal the state of California released uh, unemployment statistics uh, for the end of April. At that point in time, the unemployment rate in the state of California stood at 15 and a half percent. We have not seen that level of unemployment since they started measuring in the current system, uh, which goes back to 1976. Uh, by contrast, during the Great Recession of 2008, uh, California unemployment was just over 12% for a period of time. So obvious we are in a period of uh, uh, an unprecedented situation. Uh, CACF, uh, we got together as a group. We've uh, leveraged some of our subcommittees um, starting back at the, in April to look at scenarios uh, and situations that could confront the district. Uh, we've actually boiled it down. We actually threw out most of the work that we went through because the situation was pretty dynamic. And so we boiled it down to um, a set of points that we wanted to deliver to the board and staff tonight. And so as part of that, we're going to, uh, Curtis is actually going to review lessons learned from previous recessions and recoveries. Um, I'll come back, back and review some recovery scenarios. And then we have some recommendations. So with that, over to Curtis Cole. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, board members. Um, Marcy, if you can move us on to the next slide. And, and we'll try to talk about what can we predict about this disaster's impact uh, on our district budget. And well, looking backwards, uh, we can say that each recession is different. And no doubt this one will be as well. There'll be a new set of uh, unknown unknowns. I don't believe anyone can be expected to know all the changes this one will bring, but we can be expected to know what the prior recessions suggest for us. And so we'll call out uh, three categories of uh, varying certainty uh, ahead of us. Uh, first, we know the district's, uh, the impact on the district's uh, revenue is delayed by a year and the county assessor's process and the impact on, uh, on parcel values and assessments there. We may not know the size of the coming impact, but we do have an idea of its timing and we have some experience um, uh, from the prior uh, about the scope, which we'll discuss uh, uh, shortly. Now the process um, of assessments, not necessarily, the process is assessments, not necessarily reductions, but a decrease in the number of properties sold and reassessed at market values or increases. That is the driving force for our, our, our long-term 5% growth rate that we've seen on our revenues and our property tax assessments um, in the past. Typically, when a recession happens, that rate drops by 5 to 8% for one or two years, but it's ye a year delay. Rarely, and only once in the 27 years of data that I've got, um, did the revenue decrease. And that was a 2010-11 uh, with a 2% drop. And that was actually the second year of impact, which we'll show in a chart later on. Um, but nevertheless, a, a smaller increase is just as damaging to the district's uh, budget. And the state is then going to suffer something uh, even greater loss because their revenues are impacted by a variety of things beyond just, just property taxes. And, uh, and naturally, they have in the past shared uh, their impact with the districts. Previously, they went so far as to rearranging their model for uh, their funding model for districts. Altogether, today, our state budget uh, funding that might be impacted as we think is about $1.5 million, uh, assuming they don't do anything more extreme uh, with the deficits they're going to they're gonna run into. Um, I haven't heard it that that's on the table yet anywhere. Now those two, those two impacts, those lessenings of the revenues coming in lead to financial pressures on the districts. And in the past, we've ended up cutting or changing programs to save money. 
Um, our business model has a built-in annual increase in expenses, which means that flat revenue is a problem and not sustainable. And because our, but because our district, the impact is delayed by a year, the good news is we have time to implement any changes and thus we can lessen that by spreading the cuts over more years. For example, a, a million dollar cut in one year can be lessened to a half million dollars over two years if it's something of that small scale. I'm sure we're unfortunately talking about something larger than that. As for the actual size or depth and length of the problem, let's turn to the next slide. Um, and bear with me a little bit on, on the complexity on this side as I uh, walk you through it and explain what we've got here. We're, um, um, how long and how deep were the prior recessions? The message is that it takes time for the revenue to the district to recover from a recession, but of course, how long and what's the definition of it to recover? Because we have costs that ride each year to account for inflation and career growth for our employees, the natural stable or sort of balance point on our district and long-term average for our revenue is a 5% per year uh, slope. So that means the dashed line on that chart there is really the natural line that would like to be uh, above, if you wish. It's a happy slope. Lines that are rising more steeply than that, steeply than that, such as the ones on the left up to the base here, are good. That means revenue is increasing faster. And uh, the loans that are less steep and more flat are bad. There's an expense line that tracks the same slope as that dashed line, because our expenses naturally enough follow along with our, uh, with our revenues over the long term. So we've looked at the last four uh, disruptions and it marks sort of a base here at the time like we are right now. We know we're in trouble, but it hasn't hit us yet and we don't know um, how big it's gonna be. So it's our last good point and the starting point for the analysis. Now notice on the chart that up to that point of that base here line, if you draw, draw sort of a, a vertical line over the words base here, um, up to that point, the lines are all sloped up, steeping or below the dashed line and coming in. That means the revenues were growing faster than that 5% growth Maybe the district budget was in surplus, and maybe hopefully they were contributing to reserves at that time. And then after the base year, um, revenue switches again and it is impacted and falls below 5%. And if there were no changes on the expense side, we'd move more toward or more toward or even into a deficit and over time have to draw down our reserves. So let's talk a little bit specifically about two of these lines real quickly. In 1993 recession, the, the, the blue line, um, and, uh, and the question there is that blue line was rising very steeply up to the base here. We were probably having 9%. I have the data, I don't remember what it is, probably 9% per year increases in, in revenue and such, and growing in enrollment and a, and a few things there as well, too. Things were different. Um, but then the recession happened and, it, and it, it dipped below that. And it took two or three years before that blue line reaches back up to the dash line there. That means it recovered back up to the point where it was before. And if you continued expenses along, that means you could end your deficit spending or stop uh, spending money out of reserves. So at the time, I don't think we had advanced reserves there um, and such and get back to that. Um, the area under that dash line up until the blue gets up to, um, that's the amount you have to increase or decrease expenses or reduce the budget surplus. Um, and it's easily to, for that area to reach up to 10% of the budget in just a few years. Now, 2008, more recent, was, was quite different, that green line. Um, now, note that right after the base year, the green line dips below your 5% again. We had like a 2% growth instead of 5%. And then it actually dips even further down back to the $100 line or the, where we started two years before because there was that 2% negative growth. We actually had revenue decrease from one year to another. And then it's been creeping back up since then. And even recently we've had uh, growth, you know, in five, six or 7% faster than that. But it's never actually gotten back to the point where it would have been had we never had that 2008 financial recession. Now, and so a scope something like that, things, things changed, you know, models changed, revenue came down. So today there's sort of a new dashed line. It's a little bit lower than that. Uh, that one is closer to, closer to where the green line is. But, what we should really, one should really expect is it will take a few years to return to where we were, such as the data we have there, four, two, or three years for the past three, um, few decent recessions. 2008 was a game changer. And uh, that area under that dashed line, you know, the summation over those four, two, or three years, that's money you have to find somewhere, either out, out of reserves if you have them large enough, or deferring some costs or even some temporary or even permanent cuts to some programs and revenue saves along the way. 
So happy to answer a couple of questions about past lessons before I hand the uh, microphone back to Fred, if you'd like. Any board members have any questions? Feel free to just unmute yourselves. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm hanging around and back okay. to you, Fred. Great, thanks, Curtis. Thanks. If we can go on to the next slide. So what, what we do in the next slide is we're applying some of what Curtis reviewed from past recessions and looking forward. And so we, we chose um, two scenarios and we've also superimposed the last um, recession from 2008, also known as the Great uh, Recession. I would share with you, we, we actually had, a, had three, um, three to four other scenarios that we considered. We looked at the different shapes, be it a V, a W, a U, an L, um, had quite a bit of discussion. In the appendix, I have some reference material of prognostications from the uh, Congressional Budget Office as well as from the Conference Board, and we accessed other material as well. In our discussions, we brought it down to, to a couple scenarios just to give the board something to think about. We don't uh, believe that we as CACF can predict what the recession uh, and recovery will look like. That's not our job. We're looking to provide an envelope of reasonable scenarios that uh, you, you might consider um, as we're looking at the budget. Um, so let me, let me orient you um, on this slide. So the two, um, so the green line is what I would have you look at. This is the 2008 recession uh, that Curtis just reviewed. We, we, what this is expressing is actually the growth in property tax revenue that we just reviewed instead of doing, uh, so I, I would um, ask forgiveness to the board. We were actually preparing this material in parallel. Um, we had done one with the slanted chart and this is turned uh, on its uh, side. So uh, the numbers are the same. Uh, but just to orient you, the green is that recession that Curtis was just speaking about, the Great Recession. So when you look at it, the uh, property tax revenue uh, was uh, close to 8% the first year uh, from when the recession began. And it wasn't, which that would have been 2008, 2009. And we didn't see a dip until the third year, which is that minus 2%. So that would have been the 2010, 2011 year. And then we snapped back up to uh, 4% and then hit almost 6%. Inside of the proposed budget, which is the next agenda item for you, um, there's a, we, we applied a base case, all right? And so the base case is the blue. And so you can see we have the blue is uh, we're at, for the upcoming year, we would be at 5% and then we go flat, no growth. And as Curtis mentioned, because we have a, a built-in cost increase, Going flat, going having zero growth is actually bad, all right? So we're, we had, that, in that scenario, two, two years of zero growth, and then we come up to three little, um, actually, those numbers are backwards. It should actually be, uh, we come up to 4% for two years. Um, so, so that's what happens there. So we looked at a few different scenarios. One was considerably worse than what we're showing here, and we decided on one um, scenario to share with the board, which is what we referenced as this red line, which is called the deep V-shaped uh, recessions. So for 21, 20 to 21, we're, we're keeping where we are with the base case. And then we're saying we go into an immediate decline, which would bring us all, all the way down to a negative growth or a, or a decrease in property tax revenue of 3%. So when Curtis was mentioning about the 8 to 10% drop, the 5 to go minus 3 is what what we were referencing there. And then we, we snap back up and we get up to five to 6%. We had a discussion as to why to choose this scenario. Um, candidly, it was the recovery was more similar in terms of the shape and the impact from a revenue perspective as the Great Recession. And so that was one of the reasons why we had um, selected um, this one. Let me see if I have any notes on that. Nope, um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, so we're applying that, those um, property tax growth revenues to um, what the reserves would look like uh, in, in this case. And so what, what we assumed, a, a broad assumption that we made here is we kept costs the same um, in both of these scenarios. So we're taking the deep V re recession, which is the red line and the base case and comparing those to each other. And so the base case matches the proposed June budget, which is in your, uh, which is your next item. And so if you look at that one, you would see, and I, uh, 
we did not put the numbers on here, but you would decline, uh, you'd see a decline in reserves in down to the 23, 24 year. That number is five and a quarter percent. Correspondingly, the worst year um, for the red numbers is that same year. And at that time, we would be below our 3% reserve target, just below 1%. Uh, at that point in time, uh, we looked at one scenario that was considerably worse. One of the things I would have you look at is it's the, the year that we start to run into problem with the different scenarios that we, we ran is this 22 to 23 year. So we really, um, given what, given some discussions that Randy conveyed to us from the Santa Clara County tax assessor, we felt comfortable staying with the um, tax growth rate in 2021. And then we started applying, um, as we showed in the previous graph, a more, uh, a deeper and a sooner recession. And that's what's causing the decline in 21, 22. And that will bring us to a, uh, you know, being below the 3% in 22, 23. With a similar, you know, time when we ran into trouble in the, the worst case uh, that we ran. So the point, this, this may look like, you know, okay, we have time to address the situation. The way I would, you know, sort of coach the, the board of trustees and staff to look at it is, is look out in time. And you could see in the worst case, the, the red case that we present here, you know, we'll be, call it seven to 9% below our reserve target. And that would equate to, I uh, did the math, about five to six and a half million um, short of our target. And so every year that we're, we start to have a decline, so you, you, you have a compounding effect, as you know. So if uh, we spend $100 in the 21 school year, you know, that over four years will equate to four and change, actually about four and a quarter, 4.25, $425. And so to the extent that we can delay, defer costs, or make smaller cuts sooner, they have a greater impact later. Or to put it um, in a more painful sentence is, uh, you're gonna have to cut a lot more later or just uh, save a little bit now. And so that's really what this, this chart um, what I would want to convey in this chart. The other, the other point is when you look at the, the base case, we are, when you see the decline in reserves in 22 and 23 and then 23, 24, we would actually be running deficits in those years. So the base case has two years of deficits, whereas the um, DB recession has three um, years of deficits. Um, there's probably a lot there. Let me pause and just see if there's any questions on that slide. And then I have two more slides for you. Any board questions? Okay. Next I'll just, it, oh, I'll just, just it, I was just going to comment because I, I think it stuck in my memory that I, um, one of the reasons that 22-23 is, is kind of the crux is because under the May revise, um, the STRS and PERS contribution holiday goes away for that year and the rates actually go back up over where they would have been anyway to try to make up the difference. So that's why one of the reasons we see such an impact in that budget year. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide? There are a number of other considerations. I'm not going to read this slide. I uh, will leave this to the board um, to read this. Um, we discussed a whole host of things that could go wrong. Uh, but we did not analyze each and every one. We discussed it uh, and the, the main lever, uh, property tax revenue is almost 70% of our revenue. And so that's where we put our focus. Um, one point I would, we did talk, what I'll share just sort of what the CACF discussion was, was on um, Santa, Santa Clara County cash position. Um, we did look at what the uh, current reserves are for the county. Uh, and we had quite a bit of discussion on that because if you remember back in uh, right when the lockdown went into place, there was a waiver on property tax fees. We also had a broad discussion about delinquencies. Those did go up in the last recession and that was very much a real estate led recession. So uh, we, didn't, we did some minimal analysis there. Uh, might be something that we wanna pursue in the future. Uh, given more information from the county tax assessor's office, but the, the word that we got from the tax assessor's office was with the short term, um, the situation they were, were comfortable with. 
Um, so if there's no questions on this, um, well, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, what I wanted to share, uh, one thing that almost every member of the CACF team implored me uh, for this presentation, make one point clear to the Board of Trustees in the district, and that we want the board to start acting before the school start of the school year um, to start to address this uncertain financial future. Um, where you know we can't wait. The the scenario I just went through is every time you spend a dollar in this current year, it becomes amplified over time, and so it, the problem gets worse if we don't address it. Uh, sooner. So we have some uh, specific uh, recommendations. Uh, the, the next agenda item for you is a proposed budget. It's a good start. Uh, we wanted to recommend uh, some additional items. Uh, first, uh, we've spoken to the board about this before. We recommend creating a sinking fund to cover maintenance uh, and repair of facilities. Uh, we've covered the details before and what we'd recommended in our past recommendation was $10 million over a 10-year period. Uh, in discussion with CACF, we decided to change that language. We, we want to do less sooner rather than more later. We want to give optionality to the board. So we recommend, um, you know, preserving, saving a million dollars of potential outflow of operating funds to address possible capital needs, uh, but, but take some action to create the fund and begin to fund it at, at some minimal level that will carry us through the recession. Um, the, um, the, the, the thought process and the discussion by CACF was that uh, this should not be painful. Uh, there's, uh, you know, maybe there's some discussions regarding Measure N. Uh, you know, our, our thought is that at this point, given the financial situation that we're looking at of uncertainty, that it's more certainty that we should preserve our operating funds and uh, instead of some other um, out, out in the future um, discussion around how we spend, measure and funds. Um, second item, um, we've mentioned this before in the past, um, our, our people costs are represent over 80% of total um, district expenses. Uh, so that's the primary lever that we have. And uh, looking at that, um, following on to many of the recommendations that you would see in, in the commercial entity is is most folks now have put a hiring freeze in place. We would make that same recommendation um, to the board and the, and the district staff. Uh, and that means not backfilling uh, positions. Uh, we also would echo the recommendation of the budget review committee, which there was a presentation, there was material in the last uh, uh, board meeting that um, you know through collective bargaining, uh, the district should consider if there are specific ways to reduce costs. CACF wanted to go further, and we wanted to give you a more specific example that uh, the district should be prepared to freeze all pay. Uh, and so that would, would mean uh, through collective bargaining, you, you're subject to co a collective bargaining agreement, as you know. And so you'd have to determine a way to do that. And uh, this would be freezing the step and column increase, uh, and that would equate to about 350K per year. Uh, so between those two items, we should be getting over a million dollars a year. Uh, and then I, I, I'm assuming and we, we have faith that in the budget and, and going forward that the, the district is, is, is freezing discretionary spending. Um, given the uncertainty, we, we, um, we have confidence that the, the district would do that. So we put these, that phrase in there as well as a catch-all. Um, uh, we've actually planned to meet between now and August um, as CACF because the, the financial picture is a moving target uh, for the district. And we, we stand ready to work with the staff in terms of looking at scenarios that may come up in terms of, hey, is there a way to uh, save additional costs? Um, are, there, are there other actions that the board should take? Uh, so to the extent that you have some um, input or feedback on that, um, uh, happy to take that now or uh, reach out to you and, and uh, discuss those items. Uh, so that's all that I had, Brian. All right. Um, thank you, Fred and Curtis. Um, I know a lot of work went into this and, and we really do appreciate all you guys do. Um, are there any board members who have preliminary questions about the presentation uh, before I open it up for public comment? I did. Go ahead. Um, on on your last slide where you're asked, uh, talking about freezing rehiring, um, you 
were a little more explicit about it saying if you don't want to backfill a position are you saying though say we have a teacher that leaves and we have a classroom where we need a teacher mm -hmm. not to rehire or what what do you no, say i think no i wouldn't i wouldn't go so far as to say that i think it's it's just being prudent and giving examples of what we're seeing in in the you know in the commercial world uh jessica okay is that it's you know there's students that need to be taught be it virtual or in the classroom and so the district yeah. needs to fulfill that obligation uh attrition is a way to address the cost is another way to state that mm -hmm. yeah i just wanted to yeah just wanted to make sure that wasn't how far uh you were going thank you yeah. <laughs> jeff do you know offhand about how many positions we are, have open right now um we have uh two classroom teaching positions k6 and we have i don't think we have any junior high school positions open right now so we have two k6 teaching positions i believe we have one special education a resource position as well so three okay thanks and we are i'll just say we are actively um looking at places where we can um have fewer sections at a given grade level um by you know we, we are evaluating what if we ran a class of 26 instead of 25 right if that can save a hundred and hundred thousand dollars or a hundred plus that that um is probably a good trade-off uh, knowing what we're heading into. Okay. Other questions? Okay, um, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please make sure your microphone is on and each speaker will be given three minutes. I will give a few moments for anyone to raise their hand. Well, I don't see anybody yet. All right, seeing no public comment, we will reopen it for board discussion. Who would like to start, Vladimir? Um, thank you, uh, Curtis, and, and thank you, Fred. Um, as usual, it's very informative. Um, it's depressing, but informative. Um, one thing I, I think that I would ask you to do uh, over the next month or so is to define some uh, trigger points. If this happens, then we need to change course in this way. Um, and that would be very helpful to us because right now, uh, my personal feeling is that our estimates are on the high side, uh, estimates of everything are on the high side, and then we're going to see worse um, than um, we've been expecting. So I would like to be prepared uh, for that worse. Um, so for example, if the, uh, the budget that the, the, the governor puts out does in fact cut our total budget by, let's say, $5 million, what do we do? Uh, that kind of thing. So a trigger point where uh, we change course, uh, we, we, where we have to change course would be very interesting to know. Sure. All right. Great. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Um, Steve, I think you said. It was just a comment on, off of what Jeff was saying about looking at how to consolidate classrooms raise up. My concern is if we're being given a, a guidance of 12 children as a cohort and we start to increase class sizes in things that do not equally divide easily by 12, we could end up with a problem down the road as well. So factoring that into your thought process would be something that I'd actually think about as well. Um, certainly we have 20% of the families saying they probably wouldn't want to come in anyway. They'd only go virtual. That might allow you that wiggle room. But if you could factor that in as we talk, as you um, think your way through it, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Those are, you just hit on all of the aspects that we're considering in each of those discussions. Charlie or Jessica? No, nothing else? Um, 
feel like I had something else, but I can't think of it now. Oh, I was gonna ask Randy, um, in terms of creating a sinking fund um, that we could use during the 2020, 2021 school year, is there a deadline by which we need to, or by which we need to set aside that money in order to be able to, to get the offset savings? As long as you earmark those monies sometime this summer, we should be fine. Could be at the end of the summer, Brian. There is no specific deadline. So there's no specific deadline. Correct. Okay. But presumably at some point you can't go back and play games with the. Well, technically authors. we could re account for the expenses a little differently, but it would be better to be looking pro prospectively and not retrospectively. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, seeing none, thank you again, Curtis and Fred. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll see you guys again over the next few months. Moving on, H3 public hearing 2020-2021 district budget. Mr. Kenyon will present the proposed 2020-2021 district budget for public input. Uh, I'm not sure if I have to do anything officially to declare an open public hearing, but if if I do consider it declared. Okay, we just did it, thank you. Uh, first, I just wanna um, thank Fred and Curtis for coming tonight and for the excellent work that they and the rest of the committee members do on our behalf. Uh, it's a voluntary job that they have. Take it very seriously, meet monthly, do a lot of work behind the scenes in between meetings. Um, some of you have been on that committee and know it very well. So appreciate it. Fred and Curtis and the whole committee. Um, tonight, in, as part of the public hearing, I'm gonna present our budget. It's, as you, as Fred alluded to, uh, we'll call it a base case budget. And I'm gonna be continuing the theme that you've been hearing at the last several board meetings of, there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you've heard, we talked a little bit about the uncertainty of how we're gonna reopen school in the, in the fall. Well, there's certainly a, a ton of uncertainty on the financial side, and I'm going to continue to echo and repeat that message um, because it's true. Um, so moving along to the next slide, Marcy. Um, I've already mentioned about the uncertainty. We do need to adopt a budget. Uh, we need, need to base our budget on some, some assumptions and we have very little concrete information now on some of the key assumptions. And so as we get more information going forward over the next few months, we'll be coming back to you probably in either August or September, um, probably with some adjustments to make to our budget. So moving on. Um, we used to have to do the local control and accountability plan, the LCAP, um, public hearing at the same meeting. That's been postponed until December due to the pandemic. Um, there will be a COVID-19 operations report in its place that Sandra will present at our, at our June 8th meeting. Um, so tonight you have the public hearing and a week later you'll have the, uh, an action item to adopt the budget. You cannot take an action tonight. Uh, I will comment that our budget as I've currently constructed it for the upcoming year and for uh, future years. It meets all of the state requirements for a balanced budget. It means we'll be able to meet our obligations, financial obligations for next year, 2021, and two succeeding years. That's the state requirement. Again, there are significant unknowns that affect our projections. And as those assumptions change, so will the budget. And so we will be revisiting this budget um, just like the state is proposing to revisit their budget after they adopt it in June, probably later in the summer. So we will be doing the same thing. Moving on. Um, I will say that we have a pretty good certainty about next year at this point in time, in terms of our, certainly in terms of our, our revenues and um, not sure exactly what our expenses will be depending on what the reopening of school looks like, but we've had to 
build the budget based on uh, what we know right now. My biggest concern is the following year, the 21-22 year, when we could have significant drop in property tax revenues. I think the CACF report uh, shared that concern very, very um, dramatically with you. Um, again, this is, will be a baseline or base case budget. And I will be talking about some various alternative scenarios um, that we need to look at and be, be concerned about. So moving on. So let's get into some of the detail. Next slide. So I'm gonna go over some of the key assumptions that underline the projections, because it's important for you to understand them. Uh, as Fred indicated, property taxes are our biggest source of revenue. Um, so the assumptions are important. Uh, based on the information from the county's assessor's office, we feel pretty confident about next year. We projected 5% growth in property taxes. Uh, as of the end of May, I just found out today, our assessed value growth is now just about 7%. So we are, uh, last time I spoke to you, it was at the 6% level. Now it's almost at 7%. So that indicates pretty strong, strongly that we most likely will get at least 5% tax growth for the upcoming year. Okay. I do have a caveat. If there is an unprecedented level on, of unemployment and people are unable to pay their taxes, there could be some significant delinquencies that could draw down our property tax growth numbers. Um, as you saw in the slides from the CACF, beyond next year, we're looking at 0% growth for two years, in other words, staying flat. And the assumption I have now for two more out years is 4% annual growth. And that's based, that's a conservative, that's a conservative normal growth assumption for us. Normally we're in the five to 6% range. Moving on, Marcy. So that's a little bit about property tax assumptions. What about state funding? Um, we're required by the county to use basically um, the, most of the May revised proposals as our assumptions. So what's happened with the governor's proposal in terms of basic aid districts is a 10% reduction in the money that we get from the state that's unrestricted. That doesn't include special education. Okay, which is restricted. We get around $700,000, and that's excluding Proposition 30, which is the Education Protection Act that the voters approved through ballot measure. Um, that supposedly is not eligible for this 10% reduction. So we're looking at about $70,000 cut. It's a very minor headache, a very minor haircut. Um, but if the state were to cut deeper, if they were to go and cut um, pretty much most of the unrestricted state funding, which amounts to about a million and a half, leaving uh, about a half a million for the minimum basic aid amount of $120 per student, uh, we have about a million dollars that we've set aside in a reserve for economic uncertainty should they go uh, to that level instead of the 10% reduction level that's proposed in the governor's May revise. Again, as, the, as you may have heard, the, the state Senate uh, was rejecting some of the governor's proposals in the May revise. So there's going to be deliberations over the next couple of weeks before that budget is, the, the June budget is adopted by the state and we'll see where that ends up. And it could, could in fact, affect how we project um, state funding for next year. So moving on to the next, um, the, the Education Foundation, LAEF, is concerned about their fundraising ability, um, particularly in this economic climate, but also because uh, there are fewer students as our enrollments decline, fewer families that are served by the district. They have not yet um, identified their fundraising target, they currently have funded $3 million and given that to us for the current year. Based on some of the other areas like the governor's May revise proposal, I'm um, plugging in a 10% reduction in their funding. They have not 
made any decisions. This is my um, my projection, and uh, so the, the projection includes a reduction of three hundred thousand dollars, but no offsetting reduction in program expenses. Moving on. In terms of the charter school, um, the budget assumes that the enrollment will grow to a little over 1,100 students. And I may have the wrong number here. I was remembering that um, maybe there, uh, may, maybe I was remembering wrongly in the two-year agreement and whether or not it was uh, capped at 1101 or 1111. So anyways, a little, little over 1,100 students, mostly in district. Um, but going forward past next year, I'm assuming flat, uh, no, no enrollment growth as an assumption, not knowing anything more. Um, and I'm assuming that the transfer of property tax monies will reflect the funding proposals uh, that the governor made as part of the May revise uh, and the, beast, the charter school will, will, will see a reduction in funding based upon what happens to LCFF districts. And going on to next slide. A few other key assumptions. Um, lottery projections for the next two years, I'm assuming a 50% drop. Now, this is counter to what school services is saying, our financial consultants, they, they suggested that districts um, keep the lottery projection level going forward. And I said, ah, that's a little too optimistic. So I've, I've assumed a 50% drop for two years and then a return to more normal level after that. In terms of the governor's proposals, a reminder that um, he has incorporated some relief on STRS and PERS employer rates. Those are incorporated in the projections, but we are not including the proposed special ed funding rate increase because I think that's too iffy. Uh, the money from the state to help offset COVID-19 expenses of $72,000 is in our budget. The federal relief funding of $80,000 is not yet included, neither on the revenue or the expense side, because we haven't identified um, all the different components that might be eligible for uh, that federal relief monies. Again, there's potentially additional monies from both the state and the feds. Um, those aren't accounted for because the details on those have not yet been finalized. Moving on to slide 11. On the expense side for key assumptions, this slide looks very similar to what I've shared every year. It talks about bringing the current program carried forward. Okay, so no major significant changes. Um, there's a little bit of an increase based upon some expected cost due to distance learning costs. Um, but basically, same programs, no cuts. I mentioned the foundation, uh, a cut in funding, but no program reduction. Continuing to estimate class sizes, pretty much the same as the current year. The projection, the, revenue, the enrollment projection has a slight decline, 67 fewer students. We're projecting five fewer teachers as a result in how those students fall out in the various cohorts. Uh, some of the normal assumptions, 5% health benefit increases, have no step and column movement on the salary schedule is included. No across the board salary increases are included in the budget projections. We do have fixed costs on, um, on certain, we have inflation on certain fixed cost items. Um, I notice here that I've included insurances as one of those, that's not uh, exactly true. I will uh, address that a, a little later. So um, that was, that's a, it's a little bit of an error. We have a higher increase than 5% on our insurance costs. Again, um, uncertainty, the length of the pandemic is gonna affect both sides of our budget equation, revenues and, and expense. Moving on, next slide. Um, we have, I have made some assumptions regarding next year and, and two future years. Um, I'm assuming that next year our substitute teacher costs may be more like they were in past years. They are reduced in the current year because of the uh, distance learning and teachers not being, being in, in person at school. 
um, and not having as much professional development going on in the spring. Um, this may, this may, this may not come true. As Sandra was indicating earlier, we may have less costs for substitute teachers, but right now that is a conservative projection is back to where we normally would be. Uh, staffing we, is affected by enrollment and class size cohorts at each school. We do have the um, coaches, the instructional support teachers remaining at the current level. Um, again, rolling over of current programs. Here's the in indication on insurance. We have a 40% increase in our insurance premiums for the upcoming year due to uh, increased property um, values, property insurance rates because of the wildfires over the past year, and significant increase in liability insurance because of some changes in law regarding liability insurance or liability cases. Um, about $300,000 of additional expenses built in for more technology equipment to deal with uh, distance learning and infrastructure upkeep. Going on to the next slide. Even though we don't budget for PTA contributions as part of our budget, we do recognize those contributions when they are, when the expenses and the revenues are, are incurred. So they're part of our annual financial reports. But I want to just share with you at budget time that um, during this past year, the PTA spent over two and a half million or almost two and a half million dollars for our students. In addition, they've donated over 110,000 hours, 110,000 hours. Um, and they, they do great service on, on top of that by managing our hot lunch program and our after school programs at our elementary schools. They too probably will have the challenge of fundraising for the coming year, as well as volunteer raising or finding enough volunteers for the coming year. Next slide, please. So getting to the numbers, you can see at a very macro level, looking at an increase actually in um, our fund balance of a little over a million dollars based on our base case. You will also see in the um, ending balance section where we've restricted about a mil little over a million dollars for the ex potential increase in state funding cuts of about a million dollars. That is a reserve for economic uncertainties. Um, with our special reserve fund, our reserve level at this point looks like it'll be just a little under 8% at the end of next year based on these projections. Next slide. So the next two slides I, I show you kind of at a high level what the revenue sources and the expenditure um, expenditure areas are and how they are changing from the current year to the next year. Uh, those are the notes off to the side. You can see um, the LCFF sources include property tax revenues and our transfer of tax money over to the, to the charter school. Federal funding looks pretty close to the same for both years. In the budget year, we're reducing lottery revenue, and I note that we had some one-time money of close to $900,000 in the uh, current year um, in 1920. Uh, under other local sources, we've got reduced LAF funding and expected to have lower rental income and interest earnings next year. Uh, going to the expense side, so you can see the five fewer teachers, offset by some step and column movement, pretty close to the same numbers for the current year in terms of certificated salaries. In terms of classified salaries, in the special ed area, we had trouble filling all of the eight positions during for the entire year this year. Um, so we have some savings because of some unfilled position um, during the year, not necessarily a position for the whole year, but part of the year um, for several positions. So we'll have a, a natural increase because we've budgeted for full year positions for all, for all aides in our district. Um, so on the employee benefit side, the, the STRS rate, State Teacher Retirement System rate, is actually down from the current year as part of the governor's proposal. While the governor has also proposed the, S, the PERS rate, the PERS rate being down, 
Well, it's down from what it was originally projected, but it's actually an increase over the current year's rate. So there is an increased cost. And we also have health insurance cost increases built in. Um, just to keep make sure everything is clear, we've got carryovers in the 1920 monies, particularly in the books and supplies area. In contracted services, I note the insurance rates going up, utility costs, um, repair costs, miscellaneous contracted services. Getting back to a more normal-like situation, should that happen uh, in terms of our expenses in that area. And I've also mentioned, I, also, I earlier mentioned some of the technology purchases will increase our capital outlay. Some of it is in books and supplies, some of it's in capital outlay. So next slide, Marcy. So that was the numbers on the base case budget. Um, looking forward as we go to not just next year, but going forward. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, the, the, the base case assumptions, you're gonna to continue to say base case because there any number of scenarios could occur. Uh, I've identified the property tax growth of 5% for next year, 0% for two years, and then going back to 4%. That's definitely, that's just one possible scenario. Continue to think enrollment is around the current level, just a little, just a little, um, it's, it's between 3,900 and 4,000 and stays in that area over the next five or six years, projecting BCS enrollment flat, um, projecting no COLAs for the state and federal funding for at least two years, continuing the same programs and class sizes, and just continuing sort of the normal additional no additional salary schedule increases, obviously movement on the salary schedule, increases in health benefit rates, and then the increases in STRS and PERS rates as Brian alluded to after the 21-22 year. So next, Kate, next slide. Here are putting those assumptions to work. You look at a scenario that looks something like this in terms of the summary of the revenues and expenses. And you can see where we start to grow our fund balance in the budget year and the year after, and then start to eat into our fund balance for the two succeeding years before uh, we start returning when our property tax growth is assumed to start being on an upward trajectory. Uh, this will show that we're able to meet our financial obligations for the current budget year and two succeeding years, which is one of the requirements um, for us as we adopt our budget. And moving on to the next slide. So this is where it gets more interesting because again, base case is there's no validity in the base case any more than any of these scenarios, right? Anything, any number of things could change. So try to identify some of the, some possible iterations. Um, one is the increased reduction in state funding, which was captured in our reserve for economic uncertainties. Under property tax growth, um, you know, you, you saw one or two scenarios from CACF. I have um, a couple of different scenarios uh, to share with you. One is a 10% drop in property tax growth. I think they had a, an 8% from 5% in one year down to a minus three. I'm going from five to a negative five. Um, a longer period of depressed AV, in other words, 0% tax growth for three years a earlier drop, uh, a negative 2.5% drop in property tax growth. In other words, a decline of 2.5% from the budget year to the following year, and then two more year, and then two years of zero growth. And then um, perhaps even worse than some of these scenarios is if the state would apply a funding reduction equivalent to what they're proposing, or at least the governor proposed for LCFF districts, which was about an 8% cut in their funding. Um, if that were applied to us, that would cut, even though it gets into special ed and the education protection account, it would get, it would amount to over two and a half million dollars. And so we have a scenario looking at that. Uh, my last bullet here talks about any one of these could happen, and it could be a combination of a number of factors. It's too early to know. 
Uh, when we know more about personal income tax receipts and property tax receipts for the current year, that will give the um, budget pro prognosticator some more information for the upcoming years, our county assessor, um, the state, the state uh, financial experts. And so we will need to potentially make some adjustments back in, in, when we come back in August, September. So moving on to the slide 21. Um, this is going to show you the numbers on some of those scenarios, but I'm going to have you move right to slide 22 and you can always come back to that slide. Um, so you can better see the numbers that underpin these scenarios. The base case um, budget is shown in the light blue and you can kind of see it looming around the top um, starting with 2021. Three of the other scenarios start the same place as 2021 with 5% property tax growth. But if we have a state fair share funding cut equivalent to LCFF districts, that'll start eroding our, uh, our reserves um, as early as 2021. This is basically the reserves under various scenarios and how quickly they drop um, below the 3% level uh, under as early as 22, 23, even below zero for at least two of the scenarios. So um, we certainly have concerns about what could happen depending upon uh, what happens over the next few months and going forward for the next 12 to 18 months is pretty critical. Um, going to the next slide, please. Again, you can look back to see the numbers that underpin that chart. So I've talked about the general fund just couple comments about our special funds. We have two special reserve funds. One has three and a half million dollar balance that helps make up our reserves. And then we have the residual from our, um, our, our reserve fund for lifetime health benefits, which we no longer need to keep. We do have that obligation, but we're covering it with um, budgeting in our general fund. Next slide. Our capital funds you can see that our deferred maintenance fund is, is pretty marginal with um, spending equaling revenues each year. Uh, the building fund is uh, made up with our bond funds and the result of our uh, issuing of bonds, uh, we have about $19 million uh, after, and after purchasing the 10th site. That's where we're standing right about now. And our capital facilities funds, which comes from developer fees, uh, very low ending balance for the current year because not a lot of activity since uh, January, February. So we have uh, a lower revenue expectation in the current year, but bouncing back up in next year as some big projects, the Old Mill Safeway project um, across from our 10th site uh, actually should come up, come on, uh, should generate developer fee revenue this coming year. So we have a, a much higher projection for next year to keep our, get our budget back in balance. That's a little bit about the special funds. Let me see what the next slide is. Uh, again, this is a public hearing. It's time for you to receive input. It's not an action item. And the final slide, just a little bit about moving ahead in terms of a timeline. Again, next, next week we, asking you to adopt our budget. Um, but during the summer, Jeff alluded to some special meetings during the summer. We expect to provide updates as needed. Uh, we will review information in August when the property tax and personal income tax receipts are finalized. I would expect probably in September, we would need to make budget adjustments if not by the end of August. And again, during that time frame, you may receive a report from the Citizens Finance Committee. I've noted December on here because we will know the annual inflation factor on the assessed value on our on the property tax roll. Um, so that'll give us a pretty good indication because January 1st is when property values are set for the upcoming year. That'll give us a pretty indi good indication of what we might be seeing ahead for 21-22. Also during December, you will have the first interim financial report, which will also help, uh, help inform our projections for 21-22. So December, we have additional information 
if we need to get into significant certificated layoffs, this is well ahead of the March 15th day off, March 15th deadline. So uh, just wanted you to kind of have those pieces of those pieces of time in, in the back of your minds as we move forward. I think that's my last slide. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Brian, for public input and or budget and or for board questions or comments. All right, thank you, Randy. Um, are there any preliminary board questions before I open it up for public comment? Not seeing any. So we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please make sure your microphone is on. Each speaker will be given three minutes. If we have anyone. Not seeing any, so I'm going to say we don't have anybody and move back for board comment and questions. Would anyone like to start? Feel free to unmute yourself. Jessica, anybody? All right, well, thank you, uh, Randy. Oh, well, Vladimir. Yeah, uh, a question for Randy. Um, who decides when to uh, get off the teeter plan? So as, as you know, the teeter plan, in, which we have in our county, requires the county to distribute property taxes as though 100% of them were collected. Yes. So everything that they owe us, um, they have to disseminate the portion out to us. Um, it's the Board of Supervisors would make that decision. The, there is a code section in the state that says if there is three percent, if there's an addition, if there is over three percent delinquencies, the counties have the ability, the Board of Supervisors can vote to change from the teeter plan and uh, basically deficit uh, apportion monies to districts based on how bad the delinquencies are. So presumably, and I don't know whether this is true or not, presumably the county also has a balanced budget requirement. So if they are not going to adjust for delinquencies to over 3%, then that has to come out of their reserves. Um, is, is, is that what your impression is? Without being definitive on it, is that what you, uh, your impression? Yes, they, as an example, I think I mentioned this at a, prior meeting, there, there was an increase beyond 3% of delinquencies during the Great Recession one year. They had adequate reserves to fully fund everyone, um, and they would have that ability again. It would come out of their reserves, yes. Okay, all right. So we got to go check out and see what the county's reserves are. <laughs> Randy, just to clarify, is that the, is that the assessor's reserves, or is that the, the county budget reserve, or is that one and the same? So the, the assessor doesn't have reserves. He's, he's, a part, he's an arm of the county. It's the county government itself. And that's their, the equivalent to, your, to our board is the Board of Supervisors. It's not the Board of Education of the county. Um, I would hesitate to thank you, Randy, for giving us this presentation, but um, grudgingly, I will do so. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? I have no questions because you prepared us thoroughly in prior meetings. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Um, and I look forward to us having more certain certainty as the year progresses. Um, but I, I can't say I'm comfortable with our uncertainty, but I, I understand it. Yeah, yeah, I think that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, I, it, it does feel like there's a lot of direction that you need that we're not providing, but I think that's just because we have no idea what direction to provide at this point either. So similarly to the state, um, this is a bit of a placeholder due to legislative deadlines and we'll just have to adjust as things develop. I would say just for the record, um, the BCS enrollment number is 1111 rather than 1101. Um, so I think we should update that to 
assume full enrollment um, because if I were in, in, in BCS's shoes, that's what I would do since it's the only lever they have to pull in terms of their um, revenue from the state. Uh, speaking about BCS, uh, my understanding, and it could be wrong, is that they have tapped into federal funds uh, that are uh, uh, designed to keep employees uh, on the payroll, uh, which are not available to public schools. I assume that was a comment, not a question. <laughs> Yeah, that was a that was a comment, uh, um, an irate comment. Are there any other board comments, irate or otherwise? Uh, not seeing any. So, Brian, sorry, Randy, go ahead. Just to be clear, um, it'd be difficult for us to adjust the ten students for BCS in terms of the budget between sure. now and this week. We can certainly do that. Um, as we move forward and make other adjustments, it's not a significant financial impact one way or another. Um, but right, I think I, just, yeah, I looked at it and it's probably less than $100,000 depending on where the students come from. So I agree that given that we're sort of putting, putting aside a million dollars for various economic uncertainties, it's not material beyond that, but just for the record. Yep, thank you. Okay, um, so that, ends the public hearing if it wasn't already over and we will move on to I board and administration comments. Uh, let's see, Sandra. Sure. Uh, summer learning for all launched today. So we sent out a reminder newsletter to families with the links to all of the open resources. I've heard from a few different families today, just asking some clarifying questions and what have you, but we are excited to be launching that. Um, and I've already seen that folks are, we have our hashtag LASD creativity for our six C's. This week we launched creativity. So I see that we already have some students who've been launching on social media, which is exciting to see their work. Um, I told you briefly about our professional development that launched with teachers today. So they're going through five modules that really focus on improving their skills around blended or online learning so we can adapt to what we might need to do in the fall. Um, and then we also have an amazing small but very mighty and dedicated team working on a plan around social and emotional learning. And so um, we have already prepared the teachers that in the fall they will be doing some additional professional development around social emotional learning in the classroom, around um, both teacher and staff and student resiliency skills. And then we have a component around trauma informed um, space and, and spaces and environments. So our team is doing some great work there and we are really excited to be able to provide that for our students and families in the fall. That's it for me. I just have the budget next week to present. And, um, so nothing else right now. Um, I'll just share a couple things. Um, uh, kudos to Sandra and Randy and Aaron and Jennifer, who all really led getting us to this point. I know today was a big handoff uh, point in time, as Sandra described, moving from teacher-led instruction to, uh, to summer learning for all. Uh, Sandra said she was actually able to sleep last night, so that's always a plus. Um, but... Uh, there, there has been a tremendous amount of work to do. There will be a tremendous amount uh, more going on. We also uh, today got our staffs back on campuses, as you know, and um, preparing for the handoff and intake of um, goods from our families will be taking place later uh, this week and into next week. So um, that's, that's a huge undertaking. Uh, it's also giving us a chance to uh, test drive some procedures as well that we know that we may need to implement in the fall. Uh, things like symptom checks from everyone entering campus to um, social distancing, 
uh, wearing of face coverings, those sorts of things. So this, uh, you know, this this is a good opportunity for us to to try and refine those practices on our campuses as well. Um, great deal to do. Appreciate your flexibility um, in allowing us to do that. So thanks. Vladimir. Um, nothing in particular except um, uh, mention was made earlier uh, in one of the presentations about uh, children who didn't feel uh, comfortable or uh, didn't feel the need to have social interaction. And um, I, can, uh, I can relate that my daughter, who is the product of two antisocial parents, uh, did not want to, um, uh, did not feel the need to go back to school. Tell Anna hello. <laughs> Shelly? Anything? Steve? Jessica? <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm based on uh, my seventh graders' comments. I would love to see a top 10 contraband items found in the lockers when the teachers got to go through them before the students list this year. Um, other than that, there's um, a bunch of stuff going on this week. There's a, a schools reopening forum being held at the county level Thursday morning that I'm sure many of us will be at. Um, Senator Hill is having his annual education forum for superintendents and board presidents um, Thursday afternoon. So we will get to express once again our opinions to him about school funding. And Think. And I think also, Brian, to mention just the yeah. uh, the um, the updated health order coming out uh, right. probably Wednesday, um, maybe Thursday, uh, loosening some of the restrictions in the county. Yeah, it was announced today that it will be effective as of Friday. Um, it will loosen a bunch of things, including child care for all, or child care for basically all children. Um, subject to slightly looser restrictions than the emergency child care. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention today, in case people want to put it on their calendars, is the Mountain View City Council is scheduled to have their school strategy um, discussion a week from tomorrow, um, June 9th, which is after our next board meeting, but that'll be last minute. So um, just something to, for us to keep our eyes on as well. Uh, anybody have anything else? Otherwise, I would declare this meeting adjourned and we'll see y'all next Monday. Thank you all. Once again, thanks Bye. everybody. Have a good week.